Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We're super excited to have you with us today. This might be, Sherry, one of our more profound topics for the here and the now. And so while we've been goofing around about weather and what things look like around this world, um, we have somebody really important here to talk to us about how general elections impact fundraising. And I got to say, this kind of gives me the, the shivers. It makes me a little queasy. And so Shanna Berkey, a vice president of customer experience at Classy, are you going to rock my world, sister, or what's going to happen today? <laughs> I mean, I hope so. I hope I don't make you even more queasy, but I, I do think we're going we're gonna to get into some re really good topics um, and kind of smooth over, I think, the fear that elections bring to some of our nonprofits. Um, but that that's the goal is to, is to make you more comfortable, not more queasy. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> okay, but great. that's the goal. And you know what? I, I love that spirit and I love your attitude because that's really important it, across our sector. Far too often we work in fear and we work in, in this phenomenal system of duress. And, and so yay team. I love that you've, you've talked about that. You know, another big team that we have here at the nonprofit show, are our amazing co-hosts. And today I'm so honored to be joined by Sherry Quam Taylor of Quam Taylor coming to us from, do you don't say Chicago land, right? You say Chicago area? Or what, either, either one is right. I, I am technically four blocks north of the border. So some people would call me Chicago land, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are thrilled to have you here and, and I'm super excited. Thanks. So welcome. Well, another part of our team, gosh, are these sponsors. And so I just want to give a shout out to Bloomerang, of course, American Nonprofit Academy, the nonprofit show, uh, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Inc., JMT Consulting, and last but not least, Nonprofit Tech Talk. I love it. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, they are a part of our team and, and they're really amazing. Shanna Berkey, okay, Vice President of Customer Experience. That's a huge title. Mm -hmm. That is a, a, a wide swath that you need to manage and be, um, I would imagine, an expert in a lot of different things. But let's back the bus up a little bit and have you explain what Classy does and who you all are. Yeah, thank you so much. The Customer experience title is definitely a big one, but starting with Classy initially, so we we are a fundraising platform designed for nonprofits. So we provide tools and guidance for organizations to create and manage fundraisers, events, donation pages, um, anything that has to do with your digital fundraising strategy, we really lean into. Um, the customer experience title has grown over the years. So mm -hmm. I've actually been at Classy since the beginning. Oh, wow. um, so almost about 15 years. I don't typically say that, but with you all, I, I don't <laughs> mind stating it. Um, so actually in June, it'll be around 15 years that I've Congrats. been working and, and so focused on on digital fundraising specific to, to the nonprofit sector. But we do an array um, a variety of things, but mostly focus on um, digital fundraising. Wow. I have got to believe in sometimes 15 years seems like a short period of time. And sometimes <laughs> it seems like a long period of time, but man, this 15 years, there has been change like no other. And especially with your platform and your environment, just that digital mm -hmm. necessity that we, we were propelled towards during the pandemics. Can you talk about that a little bit before we dig into this topic? Yeah. I mean, when we first, you know, digital fundraising has, to your point, evolved immensely over the last 20, 30 years, but really over the last five years. Um, the pandemic really introduced a, a force that I don't think anyone was really prepared for as far as people now have to go online in order to support. And you know, traditional fundraising still has a huge um, piece of the pie when it comes to fundraising, but this really did force, the, the pandemic really did force more people to come online, as well as nonprofits to, to, they were forced to adopt a digital strategy. 
So even things like galas, moving galas online, um, but even focusing on what your donate button actually means, that was a large piece of the conversation. And, you know, what we've really seen is growth in that and continued growth in that um, focus in the innovation of your digital strategy, which is becoming just so, so important, especially as, you know, new generations come online and that's where they're more comfortable. Um, and so we want to meet a lot of those donors where they are. But yes, the the pandemic really, I think, shepherded a new understanding of what digital fundraising actually means um, for the entire industry, not yeah. just a certain sector. Yeah, so absolutely. Good. So good. And a lot of my clients talk about attracting that next generation. And my first question is, well, where are you on your technology journey? You know, yeah. which is what really you're speaking to. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Sure, I think you're right. And, and I want to jump into this even deeper. When you think about a general election, Shannon, what are you seeing when you think about the general shift in media and, and dare I say, donor attention? Like, how do we get eyeballs back on us, right, in the nonprofit sector? Or should we worry about it? Yeah. So we have taken so much time to understand this. And this really started last year, mid last year, as we were entering into you know, an election year that can bring a lot of fear to a lot of nonprofits. But we what we found is actually over the last eight election years outside of the Great Recession, we actually saw fundraising trends continue to go up. Um, and so just having that initial data point has helped, I think, to calm a little bit of what traditionally gut reaction is, OK, my voice is going to be lost in the middle of an election. And so what we found is that data point actually helped to help us further go into why we needed to understand what this new strategy might look like um, in an election year. So the importance of there's a few things. Your voice is still very strong during this time. In fact, sometimes it's even stronger because donors or prospective donors are looking to get involved. Um, and some of the things that the election and topics of the election bring some of this up and they want to get involved. So what we focus on is ensuring that our nonprofits are still comfortable communicating during this time. Mm -hmm. Timing, which we'll talk a little bit about in, in a future mm -hmm. slide, but um, it's, it's so important to still feel confidence in your message, um, but maybe even go a step further. How are you communicating that impact? What is that story that you are telling? How can you be more communicative, communicative during a certain time rather than um, maybe uh, not getting so close to the month of October, which I'm giving a little bit away, but we want to kind of, you know, not completely shy away, but maybe we're not <laughs> launching new strategies during the month right. of October leading right up to the election. So there's definitely a lot of... Um, there, there is noise, but it doesn't mean we have to back back away or shy away from our message and our mission, especially when it, when it you know, when it comes to being vocal about it. Yeah. Shin, I feel like this is reminding me a little bit of even, even when COVID hit, it was like, or many of the uh, things our country has gone through in the last few years, it's almost like a, either we like overreact or pull yeah. back too far. I feel like there's kind of a, a middle ground almost where you got to stay consistent. You still have to, you know, use that brand voice. But I, I do feel like sometimes people, the, the default is perhaps the extremes. Yeah. And we do see that, you know, that one thing it's, was, it, I think it was last week or the week before I was talking to an organization and, you know, they were talking about, did you see what happened with all the tornadoes um, mm -hmm. in the Midwest? And it kind of dawned on me. I didn't hear about it as much as I typically would in the media. Well, there was a lot going on from a political standpoint during that time. And that didn't get the media attention that it normally does. Because of that, we they saw a decline in donations. And because one of the primary resources that they use to spread the word of what they do is during some of those media times. And so even these large national disasters kind of aren't getting the, the spotlight in the same way that they typically would during a year. 
So we kind of went into, okay, what are we doing? What are you doing? How can we support you? What did that really look like? How are you pivoting your strategy? You know, when an election year is happening, the dollar amounts to spend on media skyrocket. Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to spend as much. So what, where are you focused? And that was really the, the root of the conversation. And she said something that I just, I so appreciated because I hadn't heard it before. And it was, I'm going back to my community. I'm going back to what I know and what feels so good and at home, which is my community. So going back to the donors that exist, talking to them about what's happening, being very um, connected to her community, which I, I thought was just such a great way of kind of bringing it back to, okay, I, I know what I know. I don't have to yeah. shy away from it. I can go back to my donors. I can go back to my sustainers. I can go back to my board um, and have these conversations and, you know, let people know what's really going on so that we can still continue to move forward with, with our mission. Um, so I really love that. Um, again, I've been having this conversation for quite some time. So um, well, I, I, I love the community aspect. You know, Shanna, I, I love your, I love your tenor and your tone because I think um, at the end of the day, nobody gets ahead when they get freaked out and they get yeah. stressed out. So I love the things that you've said, but what I'm hearing you say is it's almost like back to basics. It, it's, it's like what your client said, I'm going back to my community mm -hmm. because those people know you, trust you, value you. And oh my gosh, that, I mean, I feel like we could wrap up the show right now because that's <laughs> a huge message. And I just think it kind of deescalates some of this panic. Um, one of the things that you've talked about too with us, and that is to be thinking forward about how possibly in-person events might conflict with the election or might be harder to manage or I mean, talk about this whole thing that that we need to think about. Yeah, so there's it, it it's not just events. You know, one thing that um I was talking with another organization this this was a few months ago and they were talking about one of their big capital campaigns and when they were going to launch their big capital campaign. And they mentioned doing it, and I go back to October, um, but they mentioned doing it in October. And I was like, heck, do, can we talk about this a little bit? <laughs> do we mind bringing that up? Because you are you are competing a little bit for um, just attention um, during that time. So it is, it is on events, but we also are seeing it when you're launching new programs or new campaigns. We just want to be mindful of it. So during this time, there's a lot of different events that are capturing audiences. Um, so it might be um, the Democratic National Convention. It might be, the, I mean, we, I think there's 12 major events that we want to be mindful of throughout the year where it might not make sense to launch that or host that event during that time. So October is one of those where, again, don't stop talking, um, but you might want to be mindful of you know, does it really make sense to have your gala that's a week away from actual election day or even the week of the election? Um, so we have started to see some of our uh, nonprofits move away from that. Maybe it's a little bit more in September rather than um, October, you know, later November, even into Giving Tuesday timeframe. That's something that also that we've been talking about a lot is how is Giving Tuesday actually going to in in interact um, how's giving season going to interact with the election year? Again, we go back to the data and the data doesn't state that it's going to dramatically impact us um, from a nonprofit fundraising standpoint. But I do think we can be as strategic and mindful and thoughtful in um, hosting these events. Again, you might have some donors who have decided, hey, instead of the major gift that I typically give, I'm actually going to split it in between two. I'm going to split it for... Um, you know, the nonprofit and potentially, you know, where they sit politically. We are yeah. seeing that more with high net worth donors. Um, mm -hmm. And so making sure that we're getting in front of those conversations so that from a timing perspective, you aren't getting to September wondering when that high net worth donor donation is going to come in and you're having those conversations now. So I really look at timing from an events perspective. We need to be mindful really of October, November timeframe. 
uh, from a uh, publishing or announcing new campaigns or new programs. And then also just making sure that the you're not getting too late to have some of those really important conversations with some of those high net worth donors. You're having those conversations now. In some cases, in January. <laughs> um, but if you haven't, there's no problem with that, you know, starting those conversations now, which I think are, is just so important. So good. Shanna, this is a little bit like me who planned their wedding on Super Bowl Sunday weekend. <laughs> I, I, I thought February was a good month, but not for my football family. So yeah, I, 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 I yeah, <laughs> I'm, my brother is still talking about that, but I think it's, uh, perhaps I should have known my audience, uh, which is my football family. Um, yeah. But I think it really is just pausing. And I think sometimes it is hard when we're, you know, we're on our fiscal year, we're on our schedule, we're on our campaign to really kind of take our head up and say, what is really important right now to our partners and, and who's funding us and, and to really be in tune. That's a great reminder to, you know, they all have personal lives and are are focused on those types of things at many times during the years and, and just to be sensitive to that in our scheduling. Yeah, completely. It's so it's such a, a wise way to be thinking about this. Another thing I can't wait to hear from you and get your perspective on this, that you're advising us to craft a rapid response strategy. Sounds good. What is yeah, it? I and know. I'm, what is it? I need it. And I'm, I'm like <laughs> on the edge of my seat. I need to know yeah. this. I need this information, right? What is this? Yeah, so a rapid risk, I think all nonprofits should have a rapid response strategy, no matter if you're in an election year or not. Mm -hmm. um, because at any point, you need to be able to bring a lot of things together in a very short amount of time, get in front of an audience and captivate that audience. And so what a rapid response strategy, it, it sounds really big, but it, it really is just the ability to mobilize people very quickly. Mm -hmm. So during an election year, um, whether it be the issues or the causes, many people um, might not otherwise be aware of, all of a sudden those things come to the foreground. And the emphasis on voting makes people way more aware of their ability to have an impact. So a lot of times these people aren't super familiar with your organization. So mm -hmm. where we see a rapid response strategy is, okay, this issue that is specific to me is, is hot in the press right now. We need to be associated to this conversation, ensuring that you have a campaign or a place that someone can go and understand that sort of topic, as well as the impact that you're making. So a campaign is very, very um uh, important there. Secondly, is ensuring that you have an ability to communicate to the new donors that might be coming through this rapid response, right? So uh, ensuring that, you know, new donors who might be coming and seeing the impact then donate. Oftentimes, these donors are smaller donors. Um, they are looking, you know, you're more at your like, five to $50 range donor, this isn't necessarily going to be the, the really big donors, because we do know donor stewardship is so critical after rapid response um, donors come through, because oftentimes you can grow them into, you know, really great sustainers or even larger um, donors as they um, continue to mature with your organization. But it can take a few different forms. Um, it's all about capturing the donors who all of a sudden have this interest in your cause and a lot of times we see this triggered by certain things that come up in an election. We want to make sure that nonprofits are able to actually cap, you know, captivate those or those individuals who are wanting to be a part of a solution. And our nonprofits and what we our industry does that we pro often provide solutions. And these types of donors in this rapid response strategy are, are looking for that. I love, I love that. that. And again, I love your approach. It's it's holistic, it's smart, it's basic, but it's not fear-based. And yeah. I so I got to call that out. I really appreciate that because um it's so easy to kind of, you know, spiral down and be be victimized or or thinking about that. But on the other hand, I've got to <laughs> have you talk to us about this because this is horrifically funny. And you, do you advise we might, us? we might hang up and go do this. Oh my yeah. God. Well, one, of, one of us, I won't say whom, 
I said that I, they had maybe done this yesterday. I did this yesterday. <laughs> okay. Was, I, I did this yesterday. I didn't know I, it had a name, but I actually made a rage gift yesterday. So <laughs> I mean, Same. Sherry, can you, can you describe that experience? Cause you might do a better job than what I, I would. Well, you know, I will tell you, it wasn't of anything political, but I, I found out about a, someone, not without going into too many details, but in essence, um, there was an injustice made against a child, and I'm not standing for it. And so I said, I, I have to make an investment, um, you know, to really put my money where my mouth is. And so I did, and I feel really good about it. And what's interesting is I've actually gone back to the page about three times to see the goal, because I want this person to hit their goal so that they can really protect their child. And so it is so funny that like I give, you know, often to my amazing clients and such, but I don't go back and see how their campaign is doing. But this one, because there was rage, I've gone back multiple times to see. So it is so funny. And it's, well, this is perfect because this is exactly <laughs> what this is. It's, it's so much more of a connection and emotional connection mm -hmm. as to why you continue to go back. And so much so that, if that fundraiser might come back to you and say, I'm close to hitting my goal. Can you help me with another $10? You are much more likely because of, because of this emotional connection. This is rage giving. <laughs> and so it's, it's, I've tried to evolve the term. So it's not rooted in rage, you know, my positive outlook, <laughs> it's not catching on. I'll tell you. So I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with the rage giving as yeah, far as the terminology is, is, is concerned, but you know, Sherry, your example is exactly what happens and what we often see during an election year, especially after the election. So whether it's mm -hmm. issues or a candidate will often um, propel people into action. And it really is a beautiful thing because they often will turn to the nonprofit space to have to take that action. Um, and so they're often looking for where do I go next to make a change? Where do I go next to ensure that my belief is shown somewhere? And so these um, it's very similar to the, you know, ensuring that the rapid response strategy is in play. Your rage giving fits with your rapid response strategy. So we want to make sure that those donors are stewarded in the best way possible. Again, we go back to, we often see their smaller dollar donors. They are, they are voting with their dollar mm -hmm. in this case, and they will often become sustainers. Um, so what we have seen in the past is that during an election year, you do see a little bit of an increase in recurring donors after you've been able to convert them from one time to recurring. So there's a lot of opportunity in, in these sorts of um, rage giving types of situations. Uh, one important note that has come up a few times um, is there are a lot of causes that aren't going to promote rage giving. Um, so you might not necessarily be in, you know, the environment um, sec environmental sector or even in some of the sectors that are a little bit more polarizing. What happens then? Well, there's still there's still need to ensure you have this strategy and and mindset even going into um, even going into uh, you know the end of the election year. So I was just talking to a food bank and the food banks. Okay, I'm I'm really trying to figure out where I fit into this whole understanding of the election year, and we're not you know I don't think we're going to see spikes like food insecurity is actually a really big issue. It's just talked about in a slightly different way. So when somebody goes through the process, they are an informed voter. They actually might feel that this is, it might not have a direct correlation to what the rage <laughs> first instilled with instilled in them, but they, they might actually see that that is the way that they can support and vote with their dollar. Um, and so we, I think there's huge opportunity um, with, <laughs> with rage givers, um, and making sure that you are stewarding them, um, because they do often and can often turn into a sustaining or recurring donor. Yeah. Um, that becomes, you know, a critical, a critical piece of your overall strategy. Yeah. The retention is key. Yeah. And, you know, totally. Shannon, we, don't, we don't have a lot of time left, but one of the, I've learned so much from you today and it, it's just been riveting. But you said something very quickly, but it's super powerful. And that is 
even after the election. This is not just like a lead up, okay, whew, we can go back to normal. I, I think that's fascinating to 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 take this and, and move this forward, just keep keep on it. Um, I really, I think I had thought, okay, that's the marker. We we get through the election and then, okay, we can take a deep breath and move forward. But I love your comment about saying, no, keep keep on this and 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 seeing you'll you'll probably see some reverberation to this. I think you have been a riveting riveting guest and I I love that anyone who's been with an organization from the beginning and and to see it through and and to see how your your organization has been growing and flowing with our sector we're really appreciative that you would come on and share your knowledge. Um, you talked to us in the green room chatter briefly that you did this topic over recently over what, two, three hours? So I mean, we yep. just scratched the surface, right? <laughs> I mean, this is a huge and complex thing, but um, I love your approach in, if you think about it strategically, uh, look, you use the word opportunity a lot, which I love, uh, moved us away from the fear factor, so to speak. Um, this was really, really powerful. And uh, we might have to have you come back on <laughs> as we move closer. Yeah. See you in October. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can come would, on and calm us down, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. And by that point, we'll have more data as well to really see how things are going. But you know, I think just so much of what we've learned is we don't have to be fearful. And this is an uh, this can be an opportunity and really leaning into that, I think is where most you will see most nonprofits thrive. So I just appreciate you both for having me. This was such a great conversation. You can tell I'm passionate about it. I, I do talk about it a lot, but would love to continue the conversation as well. And, you know, bring you some more data as, as we get it. Yeah, we need right. this because I, I was with, a, uh, I, I moderated a big panel on um, Monday uh, uh, here in my community in Phoenix, and there were people from all over the country that had come in. And, and this was one of the topics that came up. And I, I'll i tell you the room, it was like a physical shift. I mean, mm -hmm. the tension that erupted, and it wasn't like people were arguing, or but I could just sense, and it was a fear, and it was a deep concern and we had we had civic organizations we had cultural organizations we had healthcare education and we had everybody right and boy i don't care if you were you know the general you know manager of a ballet company or you were running an after school program it was it was really a stressful concept for these folks so Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish we had chatted last week <laughs> because, <laughs> because you know, I I really it was really a terrible thing to to witness the stress and and uh, this concern. So you brought so much to the table today, Shanna Berkey, Vice President of Customer Experience at Classy. Visit classy.org. That's C L A S S Y. Dot o -R -G. And you can learn more about their amazing work and the, the metrics and the data science that they put forth towards their work. It's really powerful. And I would say, Shanna, you and your team have been on the forefront of some pretty crazy things in this last five years. So um, I think you're an, a wonderful resource for us all. And, and I do thank you for being with us. Yeah, thanks so Absolutely. much for really Yeah, thanks such for important having me. conversations. Love it. Uh, other important people in our world, uh, sh final shout out today to our sponsors, uh, Nonprofit Tech Talk, JMT Consulting, Staffing Boutique, Inc., your part-time controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, National University, uh, Nonprofit Thought Leader, The Nonprofit Show, uh, American Nonprofit Academy, and Bloom Ring. Thanks so much for your support. Okay, Shanna, I, I feel like I got to let you get back to it because you got a lot of really important things to figure out for our whole <laughs> sector. <laughs> no pressure. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, as you get more data on this, I'm sure you'll be posting this up to your amazing website and sharing this out. But we would love to welcome you back so we can be learning more and, and really coming ahead on where we need to be. Um, our, our world needs our nonprofits now more than ever. And so um, to make sure that we're we're moving in this direction is so, so important. And we are just thrilled that you would join us and be a part of this conversation. 
Thank you so much. Oh, it's been lovely. Hey, everybody, every day we end each episode with this mantra. And today when I hear it or when I speak it, I think about fear. And so the, the mantra is this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show.